Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell, Pulsinelli, with additional financial support by... The Panama Canal and World War I aren't the only centennials out there this year. Author William Burroughs would be 100, and a new exhibit in Lawrence celebrates that. They've already won a big international competition, and they're poised for more. The innovators at the Kansas City startup iVerify. Also more from the Ferment Nation with Dr. Weinstein, a.k.a. Doug Frost. And we'll catch up with WIN, the Women's Intersport Network. It's all coming up on The Local Show. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Nick Haynes. As our lives become more and more connected online, digital security becomes a huge issue. Let's face it, most of us have almost too many passwords to remember. One Kansas City company, iVerify, is trying to help us get it under control. As part of our Startup Snapshot series, Kyle Geary sat down with CEO and founder Toby Rush to see what they've come up with. Near the corner of 45th and State Line is one startup who is trying to change the face of mobile security. You know, I'm a, a native Kansan, so I grew up in Kansas for the most part. I went to Kansas State University, got my engineering degree. Um, uh, you know, a farm kid from Kansas, so found, uh, I really loved technology, loved the entrepreneurial scene. So this is my third startup. I verify turns a picture of your eye into a key that protects your digital life. All right, so we're able to use the smartphone in your pocket to image and then pattern match the blood vessels and the whites of your eye. And we call that the eye print. But for it all to work, there are processes and tests that occur to make sure it's very accurate. So biometrics essentially is doing pattern matching. So we can do that and do it very well. We get four nines of accuracy. But you also have to be able to detect a spoof, right? Is it a picture? Is it a video? So we've got ways that we can determine is it a real person standing in front of the camera. Something else we've developed that we're really excited about is from the biometric match, again, does this image look like this image, um, we can generate a key, right? So what we're able to do then is we leave the biometric on the device, it never leaves the device but we can generate this key, think of just a long, unique number that we can send to the server or to the host application, and that's what they can use to validate. Yep, this is a real person, here's his key, um, but the biometric stays private and stays local on the device. So what I'm gonna do now is this is the demo application, where instead of entering your, uh, your password, all you've gotta do is hit log in and grab your eye print, right? So it's gonna look for my eyes, screen. right? Look up and to the left until you and that was it. I mean, so the challenges we faced were kind of the, the unexpected challenges were really around the level of seamless and natural um, user experience that we'd have to get to. So we had some assumptions where if we could get to this point, well, that's good enough. Well, we got there and we found out, eh, no, actually users need something even easier, even more simple. Um, so it's probably the, the level of ease of use, that simplicity, kind of that natural and seamless experience um, was a higher hurdle than we had initially expected. The idea of the iPrint has been catching some attention across the country and world. iVerify has won a bevy of awards recently, Silicon Prairie's Best Startup, CES's Rookie of the Year and Technology Innovation, as well as the national and international Get in the Ring contest. But it wasn't just luck that won these awards. There was a lot of work that goes into it. So we've got 15 folks that are working on this. Um, you know, pretty seasoned senior folks. The stuff that we work on is incredibly complex. The math, the science, the physics um, behind what we're doing. Of the 15 people, 11 are engineers or scientists, and of those, there's probably five of those have PhDs. So again, it's a pretty, uh, pretty deep technology base. One of the members on Russia's team is Vikas Gutemukala. He started with iVerify in 2012 as an intern working on his PhD at UMKC. He works with the biometrics and research and development at the core of the system and has seen the product evolve to what it is today. We started with DSLR cameras, which are like pretty accurate, and Nikon D3S, it has very, it's a very good camera. And then we uh, rolled on to a uh, back-facing camera of iPhone 5S, uh, 5, uh, and uh, then front-facing camera, which has like 1.3 megapixel. Though the technology behind iVerify can be traced back to UMKC professor Reza Derek Shani, iVerify came to be in part due to a program led by the UMKC Innovation Center. KC SourceLink and UMKC have a program called Whiteboard to Boardroom, where they look for kind of uh, technologies inside the universities that they, th they think have high potential. They, this was one of those. They'd reached out to different people in the community for, hey, this is interesting, what do you guys think? So again, trying to take you know, scientists and the whiteboard to startups in the boardroom. They'd went to a, a local company here in town that wasn't me. Um, they heard about it, they told someone else, they ended up telling me about it. So kind of that, kind of a small network effect of, uh, of folks. I heard about it, 
went over to uh, the university, sat down with, uh, with Reza, and just became fascinated. And ultimately, that meeting has proven to be fruitful. The U.S. champion of Get in the Ring is... I verify! This is Kyle Gary at the Hale Center for Journalism. With the Winter Olympics just around the corner, a lot of us are going to be glued to the TV watching incredible performances by amazing athletes. So it seemed like a good time, perhaps, to actually introduce you to a Kansas City organization that's been working for 20 years now to help enable girls and women to take part in more athletic and sporting events. Robin Sternack and Christine Kemper are joining us here on The Local Show, ladies who've been a big part of this operation for a while. I'm guessing that neither of you ever pursued a professional sports career, but this... Robin uh, might have come close. Yeah. Did her you come family, close? Her family has interesting Olympic well, I've, I've heard that there's a great background here, but I'm still thinking that despite that, this means a whole lot to you. Yes. Does the, I'm a big fan of watching the Olympics, but Win for KC is a very local effort where we uh, provide the access and capability for women and girls to empower themselves through sports and fitness throughout their whole lives, whether they go professional or not. And that the activity actually led you to be the interim director for a while. You're not right now, but you're still very engaged in an organization that, among other things, has a, a camp that I think uh, during the warmer time of our year gets a lot of girls in, in, in the middle of some very active days. The summer camp program is um, goes for two weeks every summer. We have hundreds of girls participate, uh, about 10,000 since the beginning of the program, and they're exposed to 14 different sports throughout the two-week period, girls of all ages, and the camp is also run by girls who are graduates of the camp. So it's a very high energy, uh, very exciting, fun place to be, and, it, and it's an opportunity for girls to be exposed to a number of sports they would never come into contact with. Did you say 14 sports? 14. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of what 14 sports there are to even... They, you know. they range from football to soccer and biking and every other sport you can think of. We do yoga and we do other fitness activities. As Christine said, we bring in high school girls that have been in the camp or interested in helping at the camp. We bring them in as volunteer counselors. We bring in coaches and their teams from all over the Kansas and Missouri area and they volunteer their time. So it's an amazing effort and to see these kids just embrace mm -hmm for a few hours a day a sport and we really try to drive home the life lessons that go with those sports resilience and teaming and winning and losing and those lessons carry have carried us through our lives and we see that blossoming in these kids and it's just great there's a triathlon that happens roughly in that same time frame too i was amazed how many looking at this up how many people participate are, are you are you both triathletes <laughs> One of us is a biathlete. I haven't done the swim portion yet, but Robin's daring me to try it this year. But she has successfully completed it with I've her daughter. I've done it for several years, and both my daughters have done it with me, which made it a real family event. And it's a, one of the largest all-female triathlons in the region. And we're very excited about it. Every year it grows, and we'll probably have 1,500 registrants this year. It sells out in a matter of days, so get on the website early and sign up. Most of the time, half of the registrants are first-timers. Some of them have never swum before. Some of them have never run or biked that way before. So we have a great training series that goes on ahead of it, great bonding, great activities. And there's nothing like yourself crossing that finish line or watching someone that's never done it before. So you just have to get Christine in that last, the, the third gotta part. Just got to get her in the, the lake. <laughs> I, I now said it on camera, so it probably <laughs> has to happen. That's what the local show is here for. Just to kind of <laughs> to throw out those little, to... those little challenges, and then now you'll have to, uh, you know, you'll have to, you know, come forward. I know that people will be coming forward on on January 31st here. One of the reasons we wanted you in at this time too is uh, every year a pretty big event takes place that has, I think, brought Diana Nyad in the past and yes. some, some pretty notables. Billie Jean King was in a few years ago. And we sell out the luncheon every year, and I think it is the largest fundraiser of its kind in the city. Correct? There's an event actually a day dedicated to women and, women and girls in sports, and we are the largest celebration in the country of that event. And this year will be our 20th anniversary, and as Christine said, we sell out. We'll have 14 or 1,500 people there that really support what we do, and it's not only a way for us to get people involved and learn more about WIN for KC, 
but it's also a time where we recognize six citizens who have used sports and fitness to either change their own lives or to change the lives of others and that's a great recognition ceremony and we also are the only place that bring together all the girls state athletes from the year prior we have them at the luncheon it's the first time they get to meet each other these girls that have achieved so much in sport through their teams and their schools so we'll do that on the 31st and this year will be our 20th anniversary win for KC so very excited about the next 20 years Christine as you get ready to, to go into another year of, of these activities do you do you see the, the results in, in these girls and women I mean they've been you know aging up and, and you know, taking away some things from these camps Yes, and, and I think that that's the important thing to realize, to remember about what we're doing with wind. The sports are great, and being fit is obviously good for people uh, physically, but there's so much that happens with the self-esteem of a young woman who tries something she's never done before and finds out she can do it. Or a woman, I'll never forget the woman who at the luncheon last year was honored as a senior sportswoman, and she began her acceptance speech by saying that she had learned to swim at the age of 67 so that she could do the triathlon. She further went on to learn to bicycle so she could do the triathlon. I mean, she was so inspired to try to achieve something because she had watched the women around her. And, and she had grown up in a generation where women being strong and powerful was not necessarily um, encouraged. And it changed her life in her later years. And she's gone on now to coach many, many others. So I think at all ages, we all can benefit from getting physically engaged. And in my own life, it's, a, it's an important part of, of what I do every day for myself, to feel strong and capable and in charge of my life. So I, I do see the changes in all of the women in the program and the girls and, and my own daughters who are athletes and um, expect Win to have a very bright future. All right. Well, Win for Casey got the big event coming up uh, on the 31st, a day devoted, like you say, to encouraging uh, encouraging athletic activity for for girls and women and sure appreciate having uh, two of the the people who played a real part in it with us today here Robin Sternack Christine Kemper on the local show thanks for coming thanks for having Thank us you. last week the Lawrence Arts Center opened a new exhibition of works by William Burroughs called creative observer the groundbreaking, sometimes controversial author of Naked Lunch lived in Lawrence from 1981 until his death in 1997. During that time, he continued to create and collaborate as the exhibit and a number of special events at the center will bring to light. Randy Mason and Don, the camera guy Mayberger, dropped in as the show was going up. <laughs> almost an infinite amount of works to, to pull from. And almost all of those works that are in the gallery here were made here in Lawrence, not even a mile from where we're standing right now. I don't want to make too much of, of geography, but I think it says something about the town. It wasn't necessarily the kind of rock star figure throwing the, the raging parties that thousands of people would come from miles around to go to. Like, this is where he found, he reconnected with all these sides of himself. He would definitely not have lived as long as he had, had he stayed in uh, downtown New York, London. Uh, the, he, needed, uh, he needed space, he needed a nourishing environment. It was just a really beautiful move, and, and I'm so happy, so grateful to James Grauerholtz for bringing him here. And that would be James, catching some credit at the special pre-opening party last week, along with some of the others who orbited around Planet Burroughs during his days in Douglas County folks like Roger Holden, David Ole, and one of his favorite co-conspirators, Wayne Probst. I watched him make them, or I saw them shortly after they were made, or I saw them in shows somewhere. This one I'm very connected to because William began to call them the mummies. They were taking up so much room in the warehouse, we just took them out to my farm and put them in the barn. And they were not conserved, they were just kind of leaned against a wall. And eventually, with Bill's full knowledge, in fact, participation, they were used with the bowling ball cannon. Did you build the bowling ball cannon? No. Uh, Brian Anderson, alias LaFong, built the bowling ball cannon. It's a very incredible device. 
Projectiles have played a prominent part in the borough's mystique. In 1951, he accidentally shot and killed his wife, Joan. Shortly after his arrival in Lawrence, he began exploring the artistic possibilities. In fact, in 1987, he shared some of his enthusiasm in the front yard of his house at 19th and Lernard with a young reporter who looks suspiciously familiar. Well, I started out, I had a new shotgun, I wanted to try it out, and I picked up a piece of plywood and shot it with a shotgun, and I looked at the other side where it came out, all the striations, and I said, this is a work of art. So then I went on to use color and exploding paint cans. So. During his 16 years as an East Lawrence resident, Burroughs played host to a host of rock and roll royalty, musicians and artists that he teamed up to make works with, everyone from Ralph Steadman and Keith Haring to Kurt Cobain and Patti Smith. He had made a lot of stuff actually way back when. He had collaborated with a lot of people over the years. He just wasn't very well known for it. Make the words on a He's been quoted as saying, you know, words don't work like paint works. And so he talks a lot about the, the, the sort of idea that you know, when you write something, it's very linear. You're telling the story in a chronological kind of way. He pushed that, I think, in, in many of his writings. There, there is a sort of misdirection thing that happens. But with paint, you can have many conversation with a, with a finished piece. The thing with Burroughs' work is that you could endlessly explore it and never run out of new discoveries. Whether it's his novels, or these paintings, or his audio works, etc. He very consistently left room for the imagination because he just understood that as a fundamental truth, that, that the viewer's imagination is a part of the work. As he said, when you cut into the present, the future leaks out. He was deliberately altering uh, his, his, his surroundings, reality, whatever tools are at his disposal to let something out. Not to put something into the canvas, but to let something out of the canvas. There's the old woman. See her? Oh, God. Oh, the poor thing. Look at, look at how her forehead is. She may have had some kind of brain surgery, it looks like. There's a, a big section of her head is missing here. It Wayne does a like mean Mr. Burroughs. In this case, recreating his distinctive way of peering into the details of a painting, then doing it again and finding something completely different around which to build yet another narrative. He's part possum. This dog is part possum right here. It's obvious. Burroughs, who would have turned 100 on February 5th, picked up the nickname The Invisible Man during his days in Morocco, which also echoes the exhibition's title. Creative Observer was the name of an essay he wrote in 1992. He had a scientific mind. And so he vibed more with uh, a, the scientist, John Wheeler, who said that nothing exists till it's observed. And so you can get a sense of that looking at his work, too, that it, it's not um, a man painting a picture to show to someone. It's a man uh, exploring the world and testing the world, testing the reality, so that no matter what he created, it would be something that he couldn't predict. We have all sorts of programming that surrounds this thing, the films, the talks. John Waters is coming, and, and uh, you know those things. I hope um, support the show. I want people to spend time in there. I want them to keep coming back. It's all free. They can come and look at it all day long if they want to. You know there are 80 pieces in, in those spaces, and uh, you know there's a lot, a lot to dig into. The exhibition runs through March 2nd, but along the way, there are all sorts of screenings, talks, and other boroughs related activities. Then in April, the Art Center's annual auction will feature some of the pieces that have been on display. You can see the many things they've got planned on our website, thelocalshow.org. The web is also where you can soak up some more of the ferment nation, which KCPT is exploring with wine guy Doug Frost. Don't expect stodgy <laughs> and snobby. Doug wants wine to be accessible, and this week, as he tells us, wine is weird. Maybe you don't know that much about wine, but chances are you've heard of Merlot or Chardonnay or Cabernet, sweet-sounding French names that not only tell you what kind of grape the wine is made from, but give you some indication of how the wine will taste. That works perfectly well when it's a grape like Pinot Noir or even Riesling, because all Rieslings are sweet, right? 
uh, wrong. <laughs> Winemakers can ferment Riesling and virtually any other grape too into a wine that's dry or a wine that's sweet or anything in between. In some ways, it's really easy. This is a grape. It's got a seed in it, but more important, it has flavor in it. Mm, yum, yum. We often think of flavors as being things like tomatoes and raspberries and bananas or maybe even smoky. But these aren't really tastes. These are flavors in the sense that they are made up of taste. Plus aroma, plus texture, plus weight, plus, well, hell, I don't know. Why do you think I'm some kind of doctor? My bad. So let's pretend this is a grape. What happens if you eat a grape and it's not ripe? It's tart. That's what. Why? Because the grape hasn't yet grown enough sugar. Mm. So as a grape gets riper, the acids go down and the sugars go up. See? It's simple. Yes and no. What if it's a grape you've never heard of before? Look, we all know wine is weird. We're talking about something that people will describe like it's some kind of living thing. It will be voluptuous, they say, or austere, or stingy, or hedonistic, carefree. We interrupt Ferment Nation to bring you... Hello, I'm Henry Passy Dobton, and you're not. I'm tasting a wine that is immensely fruity, but also earthy, perhaps a bit animal. Floral notes, red, purple, even green flowers, though they do not exist in nature. Yet my mind conjures them because of this wine. It's red, dark, staining, soiling my teeth pleasantly. In fact, I think we shall throw these glasses away when we're done with this wine. Yet I find notes of red apple. Methinks it is a white wine. Or is it red? Is it white? Is it a cross-dresser? In short, this wine is hermaphroditic, if not truly weird. Norton is weird. Describing it as weird, but then describing any wine is weird. Now, here's the deal. Norton is a grape that comes from Virginia. It used to be called the Virginia Seedling, but it's been in Mosera for more than a century, and it seems even more at home here, happy to deal with that sharp, sucking sound from the hot, humid summer sun. Hear what I'm saying? Now, most people call it Norton. 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 But you go south of Highway 70, at least that's what some people say, and you call the same grape Cynthiana. Cynthiana. Cynthiana? What the hell? That sounds like a girl. Well, here's the deal. The grape Norton undergoes a sex change when it crosses the highway, which ought to be illegal in most states, except that people should be able to do whatever they want. The government should not intervene unless I don't like what they've done. End of class. Well, they're born this way. These kinds of characteristics are not choices. They're this way because that's who they are. I mean the grapes. What do you think I meant? Each grape has a right to be whatever it's going to be. Riesling is going to be floral and light and fruity. And Zinfandel is going to be spicy and powerful and peppery and kind of weird. And then there's Norton. <laughs> I'm Norton. Make me in the wine. Well, Norton, I need to add some yeast to you. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Then I'm going to macerate you. Oh, yeah, that doesn't sound good. Oh, yeah, it hurts. But then I'm going to press you. And what else are you going to do? Then, you know, beat you up with some oak. Well, that sounds good. Wood is good. And I'm a little bit, uh, I guess, acidic. You are, yeah, and that wood kind of makes you silky. It brings out some of your floral aromas. I'm not so bitter, though. No, no, Norton's not bitter. Floral, yummy. So fruit. what kind of Norton am I going to be when you're done? Man, you're going to be kind of medium body, a lot of fruit. That sounds good. That yeah. sounds like me. I'm Norton. Make me in the wine. Well, at Holyfield, we call you Cynthiana. Really? Well, okay. I'm Cynthiana. Oh, Make excellent. Make me into wine. And we're going to pick you, and we're going to bring you to the cellar, and crush you up real good, make you into some must. Then we're going to put you in a tank, and we're going to put some yeast on you so you can eat, and then we're going to punch you down every single oh, bit. Oh, punch me down? That sounds rough. Well, you know, you you need punched down sometimes. I'm delicate. I'm no, Cynthiana. No, no. Cynthiana's never delicate. Oh, you got that right. Well, then we're going to Press you off and just take your juice and we're gonna put you in a barrel. That sounds great. That, that sounds great. <laughs> I'm Norton, make me into wine. I don't know about wine, but we'll make you into some port. How come You're port? Getting, getting kind of 
kind of small and uh, kind of dried up there, so. Kind of like raisins. Kind of like raisins. I got raisins. A little bit of raisiny character in with the port. Get some nice concentration of sugars, and you get these nice sweet characteristics. Oh, I'm it. sweet, all right. Well, That's we'll, for then sure. Then we'll load you up with a little bit of high proof. Oh, I like that part. A little sweet, a little high proof. Like vodka and, made from grapes. Exactly. And then yeah. we'll put that all together, and then we're going to stuff you in that little barrel there. That little guy? That little barrel, right through there. That's going to height. Exactly. Most people, once you get them to try it, um, really enjoy it because it's quite a different sort of wine and it's very much like, um, you know, the classic great red wines. I want them to realize they're, they're tasting a, a true American wine, something that uh, is a Native American grape made in an American winery. And uh, I think there's something to be said for that. With new grapes and our winemakers expanding skills with existing grapes, wines like Norton are better than they've ever been. And these new grapes may be even cooler. But what you choose to drink, well, that's up to you to decide. Drink. Ferment Nation is a six-part series. You can catch the ones you've missed and three more to come at kcpt.org. Next week, the local show will be taking your calls in a special one-hour edition devoted to issues surrounding infertility. We call it birthing pains. Till then, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Nick Haynes. Thanks for watching. Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell, Pulsinelli, with additional financial support by...